Christ. Remain seated in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and enkindle them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit instructs the hearts of the faithful, grant us in the same spirit to be truly wise and never rejoice in his consolation. We ask for this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady, seat of wisdom, pray for in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The, uh, I, I personally am not very anxious about uh, Alabama and Clemson, uh, but uh, I hope those who are will be satisfied uh, by uh, the spiritual director's promise to give you the scores. I, uh, a different sport altogether, uh, there's a story about a fireman from Chicago who died and was condemned to hell. And um, when he got there, he said, this isn't really too bad. It's just like Chicago in the summertime. And the, so the devil doubled the temperature. <laughs> it's like fighting a fire in Chicago in the summertime. And I'll fix this guy, says the devil, puts it 100 degrees below zero. He said, the Cubs won the pennant. <laughs> um, every uh, retreat, I think, should uh, uh, concentrate when we're dealing with priests and seminarians on uh, the indescribable dignity of the priesthood, which goes beyond exaggeration. Uh, very nice in the new ritual, the first reading is from the prophet Jeremiah, and I think it's one that uh, stirred me when I was a seminarian, and might touch you as well. Before I formed you in the womb of your mother, I knew you. Before you came out of the womb, I sanctified you and made you a prophet to the nations. And lo, I have set you this day over these nations and over kingdoms to root up and to pull down, to waste and to destroy, to build and to plant. And I have made you this day a fortified city, a pillar of iron, a wall of brass over all the land to the kings of Judah, to the princes thereof, to the priests and to the people of the land. And they will fight against you but they will not prevail because I am with you, says the Lord. These words from the prophet Jeremiah are in the first reading of the ordination of priests now, and they deserve our profound consideration. One time, some years ago, Eddie Doherty, the husband of Catherine uh, Doherty, uh, Baron uh, de Hewick, uh, received a letter he was working with his wife in an office near each other. And the, weather, the letter simply said, what is a priest? And he puzzled over it for a while. And then he went over across the hall to talk to his wife, Catherine. She was typing something. And he said, what is a priest? What should I say? Without saying a word, she picked up a pencil and wrote on a piece of paper this. A priest is one who loves God who loves men. A priest is a holy man because he walks before the face of the all-holy. A priest understands all things, forgives all things, encompasses all things. The heart of a priest is pierced like Christ's with the lance of love. The heart of a priest is open like Christ's for the whole world to walk through. The heart of a priest is a vessel of compassion the heart of a priest is a chalice of love. The heart of a priest is the trysting place of human and divine love. A priest is a man who is another Christ. A priest is a man who lives to serve. A priest is a man who has crucified himself so that he might be lifted up and draw all things to Christ. A priest is a man who is in love with God. A priest is the gift of God to man and of man to God. A priest is a symbol of the word made flesh, the naked sword of God's justice, the hand of God's mercy, the reflection of God's love. Nothing in this world is greater than a priest except God himself. What people think of the priesthood uh, sometimes overwhelms us, but it's not far 
from the reality of what the priesthood is. St. Francis of Assisi said in his second rule, My brothers, if walking down the street you encounter an angel and a priest, you must always greet the priest first. The angel has the higher nature, but the priest has the higher dignity. The imitation of Christ said, How great and honorable is the office of a priest to whom is given the consecration of the Lord of Majesty in sacred words, whose lips blessed him, bless him, whose hands hold him, whose tongue receives him, and whose ministry it is to bring him to others. And oh, how clean those hands should be, how pure those lips, how holy that body, how immaculate the heart of a priest to whom the author of all purity often comes. Only holy words, words that are true and edifying ought to come from the lips of a priest who so often receives the sacrament of Christ. Modest should be the eyes which are accustomed to look upon the body of Christ. Spotless the hands accustomed to handle the creator of heaven and earth. For priests especially, it is written in the law, you must be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Priests, extraordinarily and grand and important. This is what God has called you to be has destined you to be. Unworthy and certainly far uh, from being the best, the smartest, the wisest. But he loves you and he knows you. Our universe is, astronomers tell me, the universe as we know it, about 300 million light years across, uh, hundreds of trillions of stars, and our planet that we inhabit is a little piece of astronomical dust called Earth, which circulates around a dying star called the Sun. Out on the edge of this secondary galaxy called the Milky Way. But the God who made all this knows you, and he has counted the hair on your head. And he has called you to do something exceptional. One day, to hold in hands consecrated by sacred chrism a piece of bread, say four words, and hold the one whom that whole universe cannot contain. This is your destiny. This is your call. Awesome, beyond truly, beyond exaggeration. And so the glory and splendor of the priesthood which comes to you makes you realize what others think of this tremendous office that uh, goes uh, outside of human comprehension. St. Ephraim, called the Harp of God, one of the fathers of the church who died in the year 373. St. Ephraim, like St. Francis of Assisi, never became a priest, always remained a deacon because he felt himself continually and perpetually unworthy who was a brilliant man and was urged to ordination to the priesthood, he always felt himself unworthy and actually one time feigned madness so that he would not be ordained a priest. But this is what he wrote about the priesthood. O extraordinary marvel, O unspeakable power, O awe-inspiring mystery of the priesthood, O spiritual, sacred, august, blameless office that Christ after his coming, left to us unworthy ones. I cast myself down and beg with tears and sighs that we may always consider what a treasure the priesthood is, especially those who guard it in a worthy and holy manner. The priesthood is a shining and incomparable shield, an unshakable tower, an indestructible wall. It is solidly built edifice towering up from earth to the vault of heaven, But what am I saying, my brothers? It reaches to the highest vault of heaven. It penetrates unchecked into the very heaven of heavens, shining and radiant in the midst of the angels. It walks with the bodiless spirits. But what am I saying with powers above? It cultivates familiar interaction with the Lord of angels himself and approaches him at pleasure with complete confidence. Though the priesthood, uh, through the priesthood, The world acquires salvation. Creation receives light. Through it, the mountains and hills and valleys 
and caves are filled with a blessed generation, that of the monks, that of the martyrs, that of the saints. Through the priesthood, lawlessness has been banished from the world, and discipline is able to reign on earth. Through the priesthood, the devil has been overthrown and his power destroyed. The dissolute have become holy vessels, the impure clean and spotless. The unwise have become leaders toward justice, and the ruthless have become holy and godly. Through the priesthood, moreover, the power of death has been broken. Hell has lost its might. The curse placed upon Adam has been lifted, and the heavenly bridal chamber prepared. Through the priesthood, the nature of mankind is transformed into the might of the spirits. St. John Chrysostom said, God gives to priests what he doesn't even give to angels and archangels, to lift a hand and to say a few words and remove sin. And the great question is, who can remove sin except God himself? That's why the priest who removes sin is another Christ. When he celebrated the 50th anniversary of his ordination to the priesthood, St. John Paul II wrote a book called Gift and Mystery, the story of his uh, 50 years as a priest. My own just came last July when I celebrated 55 years as a priest. And I can certainly uh, put into my own heart and life what that great saint said about the priesthood. And he gives us an inspiring view of what we're supposed to be and do. He said, the priesthood is a vocation. No one can claim this dignity for himself, but only those who are called by God. The author of the letter to the Hebrews puts it clearly when he says that the divine vocation of the priesthood does not only concern priests of the Old Testament, but first and foremost Christ himself, the Son who is consubstantial with the Father, and was made a priest according to the order of Melchizedek, the one priest forever in the new and eternal covenant. And the son's vocation is the priesthood and the dimension of the Trinitarian mystery expressed and brought to light. At the same time, Christ's priesthood is a consequence of the incarnation. Born of Mary, the eternal only begotten Son of God enters into the order of creation. He becomes then a priest, the one priest, and this is why those who possess the sacramental priesthood of the church of the new covenant participate in this one only, this unique priesthood. He said the priesthood is a gift. The Bible states no one takes this upon himself, but only he can take it who is called by God as Aaron was in the epistle to the Hebrews chapter 5 verse 4. The priesthood is the nerve center of the church's whole life and mission. The priesthood is a mystery which is greater than man. Before such a reality, it is necessary to repeat with St. Paul, how unsearchable are the judgments, how inscrutable the ways of God. We should think of the priesthood, he said, as a man, a priest, as a man of the Eucharist. The span of nearly 50 years of priesthood, the Pope said, what is still most important and most sacred moment for me is my daily celebration of the Holy Eucharist. My awareness of celebrating in the person of Christ at the altar prevails. Never in the course of these years have I failed to celebrate the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. If this has occurred, it has been due entirely to re reasons independent of my will. Holy Mass is the absolute center of my life and every day of my life. It is at the heart of the theology of the priesthood, a theology I learned not so much from textbooks as for the living example of holy priests. First and foremost from the Curie of Ars, St. John Marie Vianney. Still today, I remember his biography written by Father Irishu, who literally overwhelmed me. I mentioned the Curie, but he is not the only model of priesthood who impressed me. There were other holy priests whom I admired, having known them either through their hagiography or personally because they were contemporaries. I looked to them, and from them I learned what the priesthood is what, is, what it is as a vocation and a ministry. Finally, I would say the priest is a man of prayer. I nourish with you what I myself live, St. Anselm said. The proclaimed truth 
must be discovered and adopted in the intimacy of prayer and meditation. Our ministry of the word consists in expressing what was first proposed in prayer. We cannot say too much about the great honor and glory of the priesthood. And of course, the more we contemplate it, the more we think of our nothingness, of our unimportance, the more we think of how insignificant we really are. And for a matter of fact, probably that we will remain in the eyes of the world, but in the eyes of the one who we represent, in whose personhood we stand, who comes deep inside of us and whose sacred chrism makes our hands holy and sacred, we become something most extraordinary. We become other Christs. The priest is a priest uh, for others. Not only altar Christo, but propter alios. And we are, in our priesthood, dedicated to others. We cannot absolve ourselves of sin, but we absolve others. We can bring the wonder and splendor of the priesthood to the world that needs it very desperately. We must do it in the most appropriate way we can. Most of all, through expressing in our lives the reality of the God who is love. When uh, at the beatification of Mother Teresa of Calcutta, Cardinal Sarieva Martins, a Portuguese a good friend of mine, was the prefect of the Congregation for the Causes of the Saints. And he told a true story about uh, Mother Teresa. She was doing her rounds in Calcutta, and there was a lady in the gutter uh, lying there. Out of her mouth were coming vile curses by all the gods of the Hindus, obscenities, horrible words. And she was literally rotting there in the gutter. Mother, as he always did, picked her up gently, put her on her cart, and took her to her hospice. There she found her legs were gangrenous, and there were also maggots, worms crawling in the wounds. She called in, of course, the doctor and the nurses, and the doctor said, there's no hope, it's just a short time, she'll be dead. And this lady let fly with these vile curses. Mother Teresa personally had to take care of her because all the other sisters were frightened of her. Uh, she pulled the worms out of her legs and gently bathed her, put antiseptic on her, put some of the sulfur, sulfur powder that the doctor gave her on the wounds, and gently took care of her. And the other sisters wouldn't go near because she uh, incessantly, every waking moment, were vile, evil words flowing out of her mouth. And Mother Teresa did everything, emptied her bedpans, did all the filthy stuff that uh, was necessary in such circumstances. And one day, uh, the lady said, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this, sister? Why are you doing this? And uh, Mother Teresa said, because my God told me to. Who is your God? I'd like to know your God. Mother Teresa kissed her on the forehead and said, you already know him. His name is Love. And the lady was, tell me more about him. Tell me more about him. Mother said, I will. And I'll tell you about how he uh, reigns over all, how he became man to die for us, how he gives us happiness and joy and eternity. And he has designed this bath, and if you uh, take this bath before you die, uh, all your sins are washed away, and you get to see his face and be with him in happiness beyond your... Give me the bath, give me the bath. After a little more instruction, uh, she baptized her, and she died. Uh, it's a true story, but I think it's also a parable about your coming ministry as a priest. That cursing woman with all the vile stuff coming out of her mouth doesn't even know she needs salvation, doesn't know anything about it. That's our civilization. That's our culture into which you're going to be thrust. And how are you going to bring that culture, that civilization to God and to heaven? That's uh, the secret of what you must pray for now in this retreat and all through your seminary formation. That's what you must think about how am I going to bring this God, whose name is love, to the world that doesn't even know that it needs this God called love? To be a priest uh, means you're going to be a sharer of secrets of the world, 
the carrier of burdens, the fountain of consolation and pillar of strength for God's people. You're going to be solitary, but you're going to be called father by thousands. You're going to be poor, but you're going to bring happiness and riches to the lives of many. You're going to be unimportant, and yet you're going to do the most important things every day that any human being can possibly do. You're going to have to live a life of sacrifice, which we will talk about, I think, tomorrow. The priesthood in the New Testament is a glory and a splendor, but it's intimately and intrinsically involved with victimhood as well. In the New Testament, victim and priest aren't separate. Jesus is both as he hangs on the cross and as he brings to our whole world the kiss called God's love, this kiss which uh, God is going to uh, ask you uh, to give uh, to our world. Uh, you must uh, keep in mind always the glory and the splendor of the priesthood. And no matter what the world thinks, what the, anybody thinks, that's what it is, the other Christ. If you ever go to the Holy Land, I think some of you already have, and deacons are there now, uh, one of the things you do is you uh, um, do the way of the cross, the Via Dolorosa. And um, you um, carry this uh, cross, this wooden cross. Uh, probably there's some good probability that that's the route that Christ walked when he went to Mount Calvary, uh, carrying the cross there. And uh, you go with the other pilgrims. Uh, but uh, it's all going on just as if nothing's happening. You're carrying this cross and singing Stabat Mater or whatever. And, you know, there are camels and donkeys and cars and people hustling and bustling, Arabs selling stuff and everybody pushing and shoving. And it's like, it, it, you know, hey, wait a while. But that's what happened. That's how we were saved. Our Lord walked in the midst of this. Who is this? A criminal being put to death? What's that? I, I've got my business to take. I've got this to do, that to do. Uh, and that's, in a certain sense, the way our civilization is. Nobody cares. But that's going to be your obligation to make them care. To shout, not just with your voice, and maybe not even with your voice, but with the way you live and act and speak and everything you do. Someone died and left you a fortune. And this terrible mess we call our world with violence and hatred and uh, all sorts of evil. Uh, with uh, curses spouting out of the mouth of our civilization to the Hindu gods, to every god. And to gently kiss that forehead and say, uh, you know this god, his name is love. I want to introduce you to him. And I want you to uh, have and receive the splendor, the glory, the wonder that he is waiting for you. All you have to do really is reach up and take it, and it's there for the asking. My dear seminarians, this is your life. This is your destiny. I urge you, as I have done many times, to meditate on those words the prophet Jeremiah has in his mouth and put them into your heart. God speaking to you, before I formed you in the womb of your mother, I knew, I knew you. And before you came forth out of that womb, I sanctified you and made you a prophet to the nations. And I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to root up, to pull down, to waste and to destroy, to build and to plant. And this day I have made you a fortified city, a pillar of iron, a wall of brass over the whole land to the kings of Judah, to the princes thereof and to the priests and to all the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they will not prevail because I am with you, says the Lord. Amen.